So we'd like to start off, Brad has our first presentation. It's an uh, update on River Herring and American Eel Management. Okay. Thank you, Mark and Bill, and, and thank you, Abby and all, for setting up this excellent forum. It really is a pleasure and a privilege to be here today to uh, speak to you about these fish. I look out at this audience, and I really know everybody here, and I really appreciate your, your experience, your dedication to working with these fish. So it, it really is something I'm very grateful to have a chance to be here today. I'm going to give a brief update on river herring and American eel, and I want you to notice that American eel is sharing the same billing as river herring today. And I'm going to give it from this perspective as a biologist who works for the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. I work for this program here. We're very well represented. We have our chief here, Dr. Mike Armstrong, and my entire staff is here today. That never happens, even at mandatory staff meetings. <laughs> ben Gehagen's here, Ed Clark, uh, John Shepard, and Sarah Turner. So um, I lead this group with these two projects, and that's the perspective I want to bring to the discussion today. I am going to lead off with river herring. You know I want to start with eel, but I'm going to start with river herring because it is a river herring meeting. And I'm going to carry on from there. Here's the topics that I think are important right now for river herring management. And I'm going to cover a little bit on run status, but we have Joanne and John talking about that as well. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on sustainable fishery plans and then give you an update on passage and restoration activities in the state for this year. I'm going to touch briefly on the river herring conservation plants occurring now, and then uh, Brad in the afternoon is going to talk about the bycatch issues. First, I'd like to step back and look at how we got where we are today by looking at the history of landings. U.S. commercial landings for river herring on the East Coast going back to 1887, and what you can see is a couple prominent peaks starting out about 10 to 20 million pounds b before the turn of the last century. A little peak here in the depression, people were hungry and they had to eat something. And then we have this sharp peak here in the 50s as our own domestic purse sanders started to venture further offshore with bigger boats, more horsepower, and they were catching more river herring as bycatch. And at the same time, the foreign fleet came in and made some really large catches in the 60s and 70s. We came off that peak to this low level here it's interesting, this level, I think a lot of us started working in this field in the 80s, and we didn't have a lot of concerns at, on the status of the runs in this time. There were lots of fish in the rivers, and then we tumbled down off of that into a period where we had closures and very low levels of commercial catches. And this looks more recently, it's an index, and what I've done is taken four rivers we have that have 20 years or more of counts. There's only four in the state the Mattapoisett River, the Back River, the Monument River, and then the Masket River. And I've simply combined those catches to the numbers from 96 on to 2015. What you can see is about a million to a million and a half fish in this period. And then we came down sharply around 2002. And I think it's a credit to our agency that we responded very quickly to implement a ban at this time because we had great concerns for the status of these fish. The ban came in in 2006. And then we came up slowly from that. In the last four years, have been a period of increased numbers of fish in the rivers, a little bit of hope and interest in maybe seeing, maybe we're seeing some restoration occurring in these last few years. And that's about all I want to say about that. But with this hope, I think we've had a renewed interest to maybe open river herring harvest and take that leap to consider this. I think that we should discuss this topic. I think it's a good time to do that. I don't know, whoops. Well, I think I can move on to this. If we do move on towards river herring harvest, we have a partner, and that's the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. If you want to have an open river herring run for harvest, you have to have a sustainable fishery plan. And this was put in place in 2012, and in the absence of that plan, all fisheries were closed on the East Coast. <clears throat> to have a sustainable fishery plan, you had to have sustainability targets. And these targets would allow you to track your run and determine if you had a sustainable fishery. And for Massachusetts, that right now points mainly to fish passage counts, which we're going to talk about quite a bit as the day goes on. And most states have done that. They've used fish passage counts to set up their sustainable fishery plans. The goal is essentially to set up a harvest that will not diminish potential future reproduction and recruitment of river herring stocks. 
this seems to be going automatically right now. Um, the management units could be statewide or river specific. There were five plans that were approved in 2012. And really, at, at that time, I think the, the commission was quite flexible in approving plans. These states wanted to keep these fisheries <coughs> open. And so I think they essentially used best professional judgment to look at the run counts and come up with metrics that they could track to keep the runs open. Yeah, this is going, this is advancing on its own, it seems. So I'll, I'll see if I can keep up with this. Um, <laughs> Okay. What's that? Okay, sure. That, that's, you can go forward. Or I'll try to go forward. So here's a little more information on those five states that are open. These three states, they based it on run counts that either used exploitation rates or escapement rates. And what you can see is New Hampshire has a 20% exploitation rate. South Carolina has 18% based on the run counts. New York is a little bit different. They have just the Hudson River open, and they're using a SANE survey as an index where they have a series of data, and they're using the 25th percentile of that data distribution as the, the level at which, if they dip below that for three years, they'll have a management response and shut the fishery down. So pretty basic <coughs> metrics used to track the harvest. And so we've had a ban in Massachusetts in place for 10 years. And we have growing interest in, in harvesting again. We've had four towns express this interest to us. Two towns have made written requests to open. And we're working right now with the Middleborough, Lakeborough, Herring Fisheries Commission to develop a, a fishery plan. It's been under review for about a half a year. The commission has met and voted to approve having this plan advance. And not to open in 2016, but just to have it approved by the commission so they can consider opening it in 2017. So that's happening right now. And what that plan uses at this point as a draft plan, it's using the run count. And here we have a series of the run count data for the Namaskit River. This line is the time series mean. This line is the 75th percent of the time series mean. And here's the first quartile or the 25th percentile. And you can imagine that you dip down below that three years here, you're at a level you'd rather not be at. So here's the ban in 2006. Since the ban, you've seen some modest improvements. In the last four years, we've been above a half million fish in the run. So the first draft, we proposed taking 10% of the 25th percentile as the annual harvest, which was about 35,000 fish. The commission was interested in a little more harvest to be similar to what they used to take. And so, whoops, so we put in 10% of the time series mean, which comes out to about 55,000 fish. And that's where the plan is right now. Um, this is not that complicated of a metric, as you can imagine. It's, it's, it's almost arbitrary, but it gives us a chance to track harvest compared to the run counts. And that's what we're looking at right now. The next step is to circulate a second draft to law enforcement and other state entities. And then if that's approved, we would go on to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. So just real briefly on the NOAA and Commission River Herring Conservation Plan. This came out of the 2013 ESA ruling for river herring that ruled they were not a threatened species. But they established a technical expert working group to develop a conservation plan. Ben Gahagan's here. He's on that group. So if you have questions, please ask him. It's a work in progress. Sarah Turner is on subgroups, so you can ask her questions as well. But it's a work in progress, so I'm not going to go into further detail on it. And Fred, if I just meant, there is a handout back there on the table oh, yeah. that's a two-pager summary of the work that the two have done. Yeah, it's an important process, but it, it's still it, it's ongoing. So let me give an update on this past year. It was a, a very wintry, very uh, harsh winter. We had record snowfall in a lot of places. Hard to imagine that that's your fish ladder there over a third mill pond. And that harsh winter was followed by really a, a dry late spring <laughs> and a, in a very dry summer. And we had some really poor conditions in riverbeds by mid and late summer. So I bring this up just to, to wonder how this might affect our recruitment for river herring and other diatomous fish species. So let me give a quick update on our fish passage and habitat restoration efforts. And these are projects mainly that are led by DMF or have DMF as a major uh, partner. 
And 2013 and 14 were really productive years. When I say our Fishway crew, I'm talking about Ed Clark, a crew of one. <laughs> and he reconstructed nine ladders in, in this two-year period. We also rebuilt four larger cooperative fishways, put in three new wheel ramps as well, and then one smelt spawning habitat project. 2015, we completed three jobs, but we had quite a bit of activity. There was a lot of repairs on small ladders and quite a few larger projects in development. I do want to call out the Town River in Plymouth. I think it really is a highlight of restoration activity in 2015. Dave Gould and his partnership um, took out the Plimco Dam and continued a lot of fantastic restoration effort in, in Town River, Plymouth. So here's the projects that our Fishway crew executed. Three of them, we broke out our little mini excavator, three sites, and we replaced a Fishway flume at Seymour Pond in Harwich, rebuilt a weir and pool fish ladder 60 feet of this at Pilgrim Lake in Orleans, and then nearby at uh, Herringbrook in Pembroke. This ladder was installed in 2011, and it had a couple issues with it. The exit was set a little too high. It took a lot of head scratching, and Ed figured it out, and we went back this summer and disconnected it and reset it at the proper elevation. And there's a few collaborative projects that are underway that, that didn't go forward this year, but they're in advanced stages of design, permitting, and engineering. And each of these cases, you have an impassable dam, and we're hoping to put fish ladders on these three sites, and we hope these can go forward in 2016. In each case, you would have some sizable spawning and nursery habitat upstream that the fish would have uh, access to. Last year at this meeting, we talked a lot about stream channel maintenance, and it is something that we do every year, often in an emergency mode or sometimes working with locals. <coughs> And we were quite active in 2015. We were able to hire four technicians this year. We usually have two or three, and we put them to work. Here's Rick with Pembroke. Pembroke. And uh, we went out to these six different sites and, and put a lot of time in to clear some of these uh, jams. Here's one we cleared just last week at the Town River in Pembroke. This was just top to bottom. It, uh, it really must have limited river herring access in that river this year. And so this is something we'd like to do. These three sites we highlighted are cases where we drafted two-page stream maintenance plans that the towns can use, they can be approved by the conservation commissions, and then the locals have their own plan in hand to give them guidance moving forward. So that's something we do every year. And then we're always looking for large watershed projects where we can make a big difference perhaps in, in establishing a herring run in places where they don't exist or there's very few fish. And so we're looking for large spawning and nursery habitats, and we're looking to provide fish passage through dam removal or fishway installation. The Westport River, Four River Braintree, and Jones River Kingston. These are all challenging projects in terms of feasibility and property issues. They're really tough projects to execute, but we're hoping we can get there in each case and establish a big herring run. We're also looking for opportunities to establish herring run parks. I think everyone here likes this concept. There's relatively few like this in Massachusetts, where you have these really nice access sites where the public can go. You can expose kids to see herring for the first time. And so we're really looking for places such as these. Tombrook, Town River and Plymouth is another one, but there's very few. And so we're looking for chances to improve fish passage, spruce up the sites, and, and maybe establish new sites in Massachusetts. In 2015, Sarah Turner is back in town. You might not know, Sarah used to work with us on the North Shore, three different technician positions a few years back. She picked up some bad habits working with the staff up there, but she went off and got an education, and she's back. We've hired her. So we're very happy to have her around. We want to thank Ed Clark. Ed does a lot of work for our project, a lot of work for the Commonwealth. I think most fish ladders that folks know of, Ed has worked at it at one point or another, so we're very <coughs> grateful for Ed's efforts. And I also want to thank all the herring wardens that do so much work in the state. I think it's a really special relationship we have with the state and herring wardens. I think it's become um, 
in recent years, recent decades really, it's not as strong because things are changing and sometimes sparks fly, but I think it's a good framework and I hope we can you know, rebuild and strengthen this relationship going forward. Okay, I'm going to conclude on river herring by putting some questions out there to prompt some discussion. I think these are, this is a great forum to discuss these questions. Where should limited monitoring funds go? There simply isn't enough money to fund to do all the monitoring research we would like to do. What restoration actions will be most successful? This is something I'd like to see some more open discussion on. And should we consider opening river herring runs to harvest? Do you want me to take a question or two now? How are we doing for time? Um, yeah, you can take a couple of river herring questions. I would say. Actually, sorry, whatever Mark wants to do. No, you're good. Management plan changes. Going to touch on glass seal status. And we have law enforcement here to talk about the status in the afternoon. I'm going to spend some time on the Endangered Species Act review by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that came out just last week. And I'd like to spend time on international eel management, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to run out of time. But I think this is coming for North America. We need to coordinate with the Caribbean, with Canada, and manage eels across the entire range. Right now it's done in isolation among the countries. So this is a topic that I think is important, but it's going to take some time. So I think many of you are familiar with American eel biology, but I can't help it. I have to go through it because to me it's so remarkable. Um, it is the only catadermous species in North America. They're born at sea and do the opposite movement that river herring do, and they migrate to the continent to live their lives. They're penmitic, which means the single genetic stock throughout their range. There is no stock structure, which is really incredible to think that a range like that could just have one genetic stock. The Semoparis, these fish are rock stars. They migrate over a thousand miles to the Sargasso Sea. They spawn and die. That's what they do. They are intersexual. When they arrive to our coastline, they have no sex determined. And that doesn't happen until they're a few years old. And it seems to be determined by their environment and density of, of their peers. When there's a lot of eels in smaller watersheds, they tend to become males. And when they have a lot of space, they tend to become females. So what, what animal does that? They have a very high age of maturity, high fecundity. The females gain a large size for that one trip out to spawn so they can carry a lot of eggs. And again, the range is from Greenland to Brazil. It, it's a remarkable range where they're found. This is a very successful fish in terms of uh, their evolutionary life history. I want to mention silver eels because this is the time when they leave. And I don't think we think about this very often. In October with rain events, as temperatures are dropping and during the dark phases of the moon is when they leave. And they tend to all leave at once. And you know, just a group of them together exit at the same time. And it's, it's something that happens. We don't see it. It happens at night. And we just don't know that much about it. Males leave at a smaller size than females, below 16 inches. Females are all larger than 18 inches. And they leave, and they all spawn in the Sargasso Sea between February and April. And so from across this range, they're all going the same place, and they mix freely. And the relation between the glass eels that return to the continent to the parental region is unknown and assumed to be random, which again is, is hard to imagine that, that life history could have evolved that way. So enter the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission again, this, this group that manages eel across these borders. They developed a fishery management plan in the year 2000. The first stock assessment was conducted in 2012, and that came out with identifying some concerns, some needs to reduce mortality, and that prompted amendments to the fishery management plan that occurred 2013, really being implemented this year as well. So let's take a step back and look at the harvest history again, back to 1880. This is coastwide commercial landings as reported or recovered. And you can see we had some really high landings at the start, 2,000 metric tons. I can't tell you why we had this decline. And then it was relatively low, around 500 metric tons. There's that spike in the depression again. And then it ramped up here as the European eel market, they overfished their reel. They needed to produce more reels for their market. And so the price shot up from roughly 50 cents to $2 a pound for our fishermen. 
And so effort really ramped up on the East Coast and we had these high harvest and then we came off of that harvest back down to these levels where we are today, which I think probably approach in many regions historic lows. So the stock assessment concluded that the eel stock was depleted and identified a series of, of threats and, and sources of mortality and made the case that uh, reduction in mortality was necessary. These different sources of mortality were really evaluated also during the, the Endangered Species Act review. So these were the same type of things that were looked at very closely in the stock assessment and then a few years later with this Endangered Species Act review. There is one index for the stock assessment in Massachusetts. That's the Jones River eel trap in Kingston, nearby Kingston. This is a, a small eel trap we've set from 2001. And this is the geometric mean each year. You can see a fair amount of variability. And there's a declining trend. The trend analysis found this to be not significant, but it is, is nearly so, quite close to being significant. It is the only index of abundance in Massachusetts for American eel. It's only one of three in New England. And there are no yellow eel indices in New England. There's very few in the East Coast, and there are no silver eel indices in America. So this is a species there's a lot more information that we could gather on. So now we're going to zoom in and look at commercial landings in Massachusetts from 1950 onward. And you can see a fairly modest fishery, maybe 50,000 pounds in these years, in the 50s and 60s. And then there's that ramping up with that European market demand. Went from 50,000 pounds to a half a million very quickly. And then we came off that quickly. And the interesting thing is this spike occurred throughout the East Coast. But it happened in the Chesapeake more in the 80s. And so I don't think some people are arguing that the demand went away. And so people stopped fishing. They were still catching lots of eels in the early 80s in the mid-Atlantic. But it just tumbled back down here with no regulation changes either. And then we come off of this little plateau in around 93, 94 with no regulation changes. Just people aren't catching eels. So there's a big debate on the status of eels and, and the stock assessment. Well, more so the Endangered Species Act review came out last week and said we're stable. I think we are stable, but I think we're stable at a very low level. Zoom in a little closer to the years of the fishery management plan, 2000 onward. Here's our catch in Massachusetts, commercial catch. And incidentally, eel is really the only diatomous fish left that has a commercial fishery in Massachusetts, which is kind of a sad state of affairs. And it is a very small fishery. Three to 5,000 pounds in recent years. The numbers of permits issued are here in the number in the column. It dipped down here, and I'm not totally sure what happened. I think that abundance was low. People were catching fewer eels. And they were keeping eels mainly for personal striped bass bait. And so the reporting dropped off. This is really unfortunate because I'm going to talk in a minute about the yellow wheel quota that we now have on the East Coast. It set the quota share by using 2011 through 13. So we are, because of this, we're set at a very low quota. But again, very small fishery. And what's happening? Globally, I think, is being driven by the eel aquaculture industry that is focused in Japan. They need lots of glass eels to be raised up to supply their, their desire for larger eels, which are grilled. These eels are very important culturally. It's a health food. It's a celebration food. It, it's so important in different cultures. We've really lost track of that in America. But the rest of the world really appreciates and, and enjoys eel as a food. But what is happening, it's causing global recruitment declines. The Japanese overfished the Japanese eel a long time ago. They turned their attention to the European eel. That was overharvested. There's right now an export ban in Europe on shipping their glass eels out. And so now the attention is turned towards American eel. And we've seen the prices just skyrocket in recent years for the glass eel. So. We have a process now to amend the fishery management plan. It's called Addendum 3. It took place the last couple of years. And really, what the big issues were the glass eel fishery. Should we open it? Should we close it? Should we expand it? And then should we have a quota for yellow eel? Those issues were punted to Addendum 4. And Addendum 3 was mainly to take care of some of these smaller issues, raising the minimum size from 6 to, to 9 inches. Things like decreasing the bag limit in the recreational fishery. 
So these, these were adopted. All states were supposed to implement these by this year. And just to, as a reminder, um, if you don't take care of business, Atlantic states will come down. And they found Delaware to be out of compliance for not implementing an Addendum 3. And they will close their fishery in March if they don't make these measures, put these measures in place. So Addendum 4, I'm kind of excited about, even though there's a number of things that disappoint me. But we do have a quota system now for yellow eels. I think that's a start. This was the first year we had a coastwide cap of about 900,000 pounds. And what happens if, if that cap is exceeded, it becomes an actual quota the next year. And our share will be 2,000 pounds, which I can guarantee you we're going to exceed. So we're not in a great position with this new management system, but I do support it because we need to have a, a coastwide quota for yellow eels. There is now a glass eel quota. Maine gets about 10,000 pounds per year. Uh, and the floodgates are open, or potentially so. We, the allowance is there now to have a new glass eel fishery. If a state wants to open a glass eel fishery, they can. It's a pretty high bar. They have to implement a fishery independent life cycle survey. And they have to have a sustainable fishery management plan, similar to river herring. And so, Right now, we just have Maine and South Carolina harvesting glass eels. But here's another important question for people to consider. Do we want to look at that possibility, or should other states? So I'm going to finish up with the Endangered Species Act review, which the ruling just came out last week. And eels are not warranted to be a threatened species. And a threatened species is a species that is likely to become an endangered species in the foreseeable future. And an endangered species is a species that is in danger of extinction. So it's, it's quite a high bar. I agree with the decision. I think it's a species that is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. But I think the threats are significant. So I do have some disagreements with some of the language that they use to justify the decision. I think that um, you know it, it's going to take some time to sink in. But one of the things I'm concerned about is, is there's the promotion of the concept that it appears to be stable. And if the population is stable, well, then it's certainly stable at a very low level historically. And uh, things like you know, habitat loss from barriers is a historic effect with population level effects likely already realized. This could be true, but I think there are ongoing effects to habitat changes above these barriers that make them less suitable for American eel. So I think there's a lot to talk about with this petition results, even though the results, I think, are quite support supportable. Next step, um, eel will remain a species of concern. And we may see a coordinated process, such as the river herring, to establish a conservation plan and to improve conservation and outreach. And I'll quickly say that some other processes occurred recently in Canada and internationally that had a different conclusion. These three different reviews all declared eel to be endangered, American eel. So there's still discussion occurring in North America about the status of American eel. And some people are concluding they're in, in difficult shape. OK, I'm going to finish up with just a mention on eel poaching. It is a significant issue in Massachusetts. A lot of us are doing work to try to restore this species. And I think it could easily be outdone by some of the effort of poaching that's occurring. Um, the incentives are very large. A lot of work has been done to try to deter this. We now have a $10,000 fine this year. And I think we might hear in the afternoon about um, use of that fine in any actual cases that went forward. And um, also, I just want to also repeat that Addendum 4 allows glass eel fisheries to open up now on the East Coast. So how will that affect illegal fishing in the future? Will it provide more markets, more potential for people to come? Right now, poaching, it's, it's discussed that it's not that widespread, but it's happening in almost every state. And it is happening a fair amount in Massachusetts. So thank you. That was a lot of material to cover. But uh, I appreciate your attention and your interest. Thank you. <laughs> Any time for questions? Question. Eric? Hey, Brad, the, well, one of your graphs where you're showing commercial licenses. Mm -hmm. Commercial licenses have just recently skyrocketed. Good. 
which works out to about 10 pounds per fisherman with the new quota coming up. What do you attribute this massive increase? Is this people think of limited entry down the line? Good question. I meant to comment on that. We had 179 in 2014, by far the most. And I'm not sure, but all I can think of, there has been a lot of chatter about Endangered Species Act review, maybe shutting things down. I wonder if more people went ahead and paid that $30 to get that permit because it did shoot up in 2014 with you know, really no commercial landings to speak of. Any questions on river herring or eel? I have a question. Are there other species that we should be watching as closely as we're watching herring and eels? There are, and I wish I could have stuffed them into this presentation. I, I had some slides on lamprey and American shad and smelt, but I pulled them out. I think that, you know, I wanted to focus on um, these. You know, as an agency, we work with all the diatomous species. There's about 15 in Massachusetts, and we have monitoring programs for American smelt, excuse me, rainbow smelt, and we're starting a new program for American shad this coming year on some of the small rivers in the region. Fred, can you put that slide show somewhere where we can retrieve it and look at it again? If you like, yeah, yes. we can make a PDF and, yeah. and put it up on the website. Yeah, great. Sure. Thank you. Phil. Question. We seem to have a, a fair number of adult eels in the back river. Mm -hmm. and we get very few glass eels in the spring. All right. Any interpretation for that? We've talked about it a lot. Ben, you know, myself, you, George. It, uh, the back river is an interesting case where you have a really successful eel reef one that have to pass through several very large Daniel fishways, which are not that suitable for juvenile eels. So where are those eels finding passageway into Whitman's Pond? It, it's a question mark. I don't know if they go through the flood control tunnel or, or sluices, but they're making it somehow, and no one's seeing any large aggregation of glass eels. So that, that's a big question mark to me. Um, I don't believe that the glass eels are using the fishways. 